Hey guys, today I'm going to talk about how to love Jesus, whether you're a married person or a single person, according to the church, according to the Bible. But first, I want to say thank you to everybody that prayed for my arm. If you watched any videos from last week, my arm was bruised. Uh, if you want to know why, go back and watch. But I had this huge bruise from my bicep to my wrist, pretty much. And uh, the doctor said, if it's going to get better, it'll, it'll get better within a week. And by two weeks, it'll be gone. So now it's like 90% gone. Just see that little bruise there. So I think by next week, it'll be 100% gone. So thank you for your prayers. All the advice I got in the comments, got a lot of great advice. And uh, the doctor confirmed what everybody said was true. So, so today, we're going to talk about how we love Jesus, being a married person, or being a single person. Now, personally, I've been trying to love Jesus you know, I can say I love him, but imperfectly for 40 years. And 39 of those years, I was married to the same woman, who I'm still married to. Um, and I admit, I will confess to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have not obtained what I'm about to teach you, what we're taught, how we're taught to love Jesus. I have not obtained this. Uh, but I believe... It's obtainable because the Bible and the church tells us to love Jesus this way. So they're not going to tell us something that's impossible to do. But like St. Paul says, <coughs> the Christian walk is like a fight. We fight the good fight. And I've had some great rounds, you know, and, and the fight... The fight is not against flesh and blood. The fight, St. Paul tells us, is against spiritual principalities, demons. And I've had some good, <laughs> I've had some good rounds where I look like Mike Tyson. And then I had some bad rounds, like my friend uh, who I interviewed, uh, former heavyweight champ Pinklin Thomas, had his sixth round with Mike Tyson. If you haven't seen that video, you need to check it out. It's very inspiring. But Pink in my view, was leading the, winning the fight the first five rounds, and then his uh, glove got torn, and Tyson was able to get energized. He had like a 15-minute break. To me, it seemed like it was fixed, but that's a whole other story we address in the video. But um, Pink never been knocked down in his career. Forget about being knocked out. He's just a strong dude. And he got hit with Mike Tyson's eight-punch combination and dropped but he jumped right back up, <laughs> but he lost. Uh, they just stopped the fight at that point. So there's been times like that. And um, so I'm just telling you what I've learned through my fight. And I'm gonna tell you this, what I'm gonna teach you today, you're not gonna obtain through academic academics. You're not gonna obtain through mastering the four temperaments that Hippocrates taught. You're not gonna uh, obtain this by mastering uh, the love languages that uh, the that pastor, that Protestant pastor, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. If you know, put it in the comments. I mean, these are all great techniques for life in general and for relationships, especially for marriage. But you're not gonna obtain it. You're not gonna obtain it be legalistic about these teachings. The only way you're going to obtain it is by the supernatural grace of God infused into your lives. So with that said, we're going to start with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is well for a man not to touch a woman. So St. Paul saying it's better to stay single as a Christian. But because of the temptation to immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. So if you're going to be tempted to sin and have sex outside of marriage, get married. It's better then. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. So basically, 
If your wife wants sex, give her sex. If your husband wants sex, give him sex. And you know, when I was young evangelical back in the day, every time we heard this verse, every man said, amen. <laughs> you could hear loud amens in the church. So, but you know, feminists hate this verse, but they should love the Catholic church because before Christ, this would have never been because women didn't have rights. St. Paul is saying we're equal. We have equal rights, men and women. This is never, this is in ancient history, women had no rights. So feminists should actually love the Catholic Church and be thankful. For the wife does not rule over her own body, but the husband does. You know, feminists will take that and be like, oh, this is so mean. But likewise, the husband does not rule over his own body, but the wife does. Do not refuse one another, except perhaps by agreement for a season that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together, lest Satan tempt you through lack of self-control. So this is just practical advice, you know. Uh, there was a uh, woman pastor when, you know, back in the day when I was Pentecostal, and she, uh, she taught the women this verse and said, you know, if you don't feed your husband, he may go to the neighbor and get fed. He may feed himself or he may starve to death. All three options are no good. But we're gonna go deeper because if you try and do this legalistically, if you try to do this academically or scholarly, you're gonna get burnt out and you're gonna resent your partner. It has to be supernatural. And I'm gonna show you how this is done. Okay, so now for the single guys and girls, St. Paul has a message to them. I want you to be free from anxieties. <laughs> you wanna be free from anxiety? Listen up, the unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly affairs, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. So basically, if you want to get rid of anxiety, don't get married. <laughs> if you get married, you're going to have anxieties. And the unmarried woman, again, equal, equal. There, you know, Paul says, there's no Jew nor Greek, woman or man, free or slave. We're all equal in Christ. And the unmarried woman, or virgin, is anxious about the affairs of the Lord. How to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly affairs. How to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit. But not to lay any restraint upon you. But to promote good order and secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. So I don't want to burden you and say don't get married. I'm just telling you the best would be to stay single so you could focus on the Lord. Now, when my wife and I celebrated our... 39th wedding anniversary, I posted that um, my advice <laughs> that I always give to stay married is don't marry the person you think you can live with, marry the person you can't live without. And a uh, very smart subscriber, I wish I remembered his name to give him credit, wrote something very deep that he was 100% correct. He said, yeah, I'm a young Catholic and people are always telling me, oh, you got to get married. You always got to get married. And I always tell them, the only way I'm going to get married, if I meet a girl, I just can't live without. Because St. Paul tells us, if you can't, you know, if you can't restrain yourself. And he said, I learned, you know, through prayer and fasting, how to master my body where I won't sin in the flesh. I thought that was powerful. That was a very powerful statement by whoever that subscriber was. Um... And, you know, we always hear about St. Peter being a coward when he denied Christ three times. But St. Peter was married and had children. Maybe at that point, he didn't obtain the level of love for Jesus because he was undivided. He was married. Maybe he wasn't afraid for his own self. He was afraid... If they kill me, what's going to happen to my wife and children? Have you ever thought about that? Maybe that's why St. Peter was fearful 
fearful for your kids. You know, back in the day, if you know my background, I grew up in Irvington and North New Jersey on the streets, always fighting. And you would never walk away from a fight. You would be considered a punk. Even if it was like, it was stupid. Even if it was 10 against one, it was a badge of honor if you stood and fought and got your head bashed in like I did several times. <laughs> but you would never walk away from a fight. But one time, my wife, well, she was my girlfriend. We were like 15 or 16. We took a bus to New York City on New Year's Eve to see the ball drop. And as the bus pulled into Port Authority, a bunch of these guys tried to rob me. And I just, you know, punched one guy in the face, punched another guy in the nose. And I'm thinking I'm doing great. I'm just like nailing these guys. And then we get off the bus. My wife, my, she was my girlfriend at the time, nose is bleeding. She said one of the guys punched her in the nose because she tried to grab him. Uh, so I felt so bad. And ever since then, whenever there was trouble, I would walk away from a fight because I was more concerned about her. Not that. You know, I didn't give a crap if, you know, if I got punched in the mouth. Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> so uh, maybe St. Peter was divided because he was married. But he obtained something. He obtained it because history tells us the rest of the story. Ancient historian Eusebius, Eusebius cites our fourth pope, Pope Clement, who was actually, I believe, was ordained by Peter. If I'm wrong, I'm sure one of you guys will correct me in a comment. But Clement, our fourth pope, says, according to ancient historian Eusebius, he was there when Peter was crucified. But first, they martyred, they killed his wife, Penelope. And Peter seen her going to her martyrdom. Doesn't say if she was crucified, but they crucified Peter. So I'm assuming they crucified her too. And we know the story that Peter said, I'm not worthy to die like my Lord. Cruci please crucify me upside down. And that's why the Vatican has an upside down cross. And the anti-Catholics like, oh, look, the Vatican's demonic. They have upside down crosses. But anyway, I digress. But St. Peter saw his wife Penelope go to her death. And according to Clement, he yelled out to her, dear wife, Remember the Lord. He was still encouraging his wife at their death. He was still encouraging his wife at their death. And he went boldly and bravely. He obtained that love for Christ that he was able to die. And he died with his wife. You know, we always hear these wonderful, sweet stories of elderly couples that have been together 60 years and they die the same day of a broken heart. But this is a whole new level, being crucified for Christ on the same day as your wife. To me, that's very powerful. But how did Peter get there? Did he just all of a sudden become that way? No, his relationship with Christ. You see, Romans tells us, St. Paul tells the Romans, God's kindness leads us to repentance. St. Peter felt so bad when he sinned against the Lord and, and denied him three times. And then when Jesus rose from the dead and St. Peter ran to him, we all know the story. Jesus said, do you love me three times? Feed my sheep, feed my sheep. But there's four words in ancient Greek that means love. And two of them were used in that conversation. Jesus said to Peter, do you agape me? Agape is the greatest of all loves in the Greek. It's sacrificial, it's devoted, it's putting the other person first, it's unconditional love. I'm gonna love you like Christ loves the church. The Bible says, for God so agape the world, he gave his only begotten son. So, so Jesus says, do you agape me? But Peter uses another word, the Greek word philia, which means like a brotherly love, a, a close love to a friend or a brother where we get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And Peter says, Lord, I, I feel, you, feel you. And Jesus asked him again, do you love me sacrificially? Do you love me unconditionally? And Peter says, I love you like a brother, Lord. You know, I love you like a brother, Lord. You know everything. 
Peter breaks down. He's like, he, he can't lie and say, I love you sacrificially because he knows Jesus knows he denied him three times. He knows Jesus has got at this point because Jesus told him you were going to deny me three times. So he's like, you know everything, Lord. You know I love you like a brother. And then Jesus, in his mercy, says, Peter, do you love me like a brother? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you like a brother. And he says, feed my sheep. Jesus accepted him where he was at in his walk with, G with him. Jesus will not throw you out if you love him and you fail. He knows where you're at. You know, like any good coach, they're not going to kick you off the team. If you're not playing well, they're going to try and make you a better player. And this is what Jesus does with his, just like a father. More, I guess that's a terrible analogy because they do fire guys. But a father's not going to kick. A loving father is going to throw his son out of the family because his son isn't where he needs to be. He's going to try and love him to where he needs to be. And that's what Jesus did for Peter to the point where Peter could die for him and encourage his wife to die for him. And then we go to Ephesians 5, 21 through 31. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Again, equals. The word subject, uh, I think the King James, we, we always say submit when we were uh, evangelicals, submit to one another. So I'm guessing the King James says submit. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, how do you do this? Well, he tells you, wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. And all the young Christians are like, amen. But listen, <laughs> we got, I think she's got the easier end of the bargain. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. So although we're equal, you're going to see here that St. Paul is telling us we have different roles. God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, as the old joke says. We're different. God created man and woman and husbands and wives. Not husbands and husbands, wives and wives, husbands and wives, a man and a woman. And they have different roles, although they're equal in Christ. And he's commanding the way that the wife loves the husband is by submitting to him as the authority, the head, just like Christ is the head of the church and we submit to him, the wife submits to the husband as the head of the church. Monsignor John Essoff, who a uh, 96 year old priest, who was actually the confessor and friend to Mother St. Teresa and a spiritual son to St. Padre Pio and a, and a, and a good friend to St. Padre Pio, and, and this man is still alive speaking. I'm going to see if I can get him on here soon. Um, and just like Padre Pio, very mystical, sees visions, operates in the spiritual gifts. Father uh, John Essoff, Monsignor John Essoff, is the same way. And he said his mother used to see visions as well. And he said his mother prayed once and said, Lord, I want to love you, Jesus, more. How can I love you more, Jesus? And she's seen a vision of Jesus and then Jesus's face changed into her husband's face and he said love your husband it's powerful so for a wife a married woman who wants to love Jesus more love your husband the way the Bible teaches you but again you're not gonna be able to do this academically legalistically on your own strength it only comes by the grace of God by the supernatural grace that is given to us in the sacrament of marriage. But now he goes on and tells husbands what they got to do. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So she's got to be willing to submit to the husband, but the husband has to be willing to die for her. And I submit to you that St. Paul isn't just talking about dying physically which is a given 
any man should be able to will, you know, should be able to give his life for his wife, take a bullet for his wife. But if we read the rest of it, it's dying to self. We're going to read the rest of it. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. He's given us an example of Christ's relationship to his church and our relationship to our wives or wives. This is why the church says it's a sacrament. It's, it, it represents, and, and just like everything in Catholicism is so different than Protestantism, where Protestantism, everything is symbolic. No, it's real. Just like he said, this is my flesh, and they say it's symbolic. He's saying your relationship with your wife is like the relationship with God. It's real. It's not symbolic. It's real. So there's real grace. There's real supernatural power available to us to obtain this. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. As Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. Again, he's quoting Genesis. But the New Testament reveals what marriage was meant to be. We're meant to be one flesh, like we're one with Jesus. Jesus said when he gave his body, he said, this is my body. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I abide in you. So as we abide in Christ and we abide in each other, we have this supernatural agape love. And we minister to one another. We become one flesh with Christ and your husband and your wife. This is a great mystery. St. Jerome said, uh, got, said the word mystery means sacramentum. Where we get the word sacrament. This is a sacrament. And I mean in reference to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. Again, St. Paul always puts... Uh, practical advice with this supernatural power and again you need the supernatural power to live out the 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 practical advice you could you know you could do it for a year five years ten years but we're doing this for life so we need the supernatural power and every study shows the most that men want is respect you know respect your husband this is what men desire and women they want to be loved love her as much as you love yourself Lover has Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He loved us first. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for her. So the initiative belongs to us. The initiative of grace belongs to God. Jesus Christ, according to uh, the Catechism, uh, paragraph 2010. So the initiative of loving is us. If, you're, if, if your marriage is failing, husbands, look in the mirror. Don't blame your wife. The initiative belongs to us. We have the greater responsibility. We're called to love our wives like Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? They listened to him. He, had, he was the authority. They knew he was the Lord. But he said he didn't come to be served. He came to serve. And he washed their feet. You know, there's a pr uh, priest that uh, was in Pope Francis's order when Pope Francis was a priest. And he said... You know, Pope Francis was a tough guy. If you, if you don't know about Pope Francis, he was a bouncer. He was a pretty tough guy. He wasn't, you know, uh, he wasn't always Pope. <laughs> but he, he got a radical calling from God and God transformed his life and he just was sold out uh, for Jesus. And in his order, they said, uh, even though he was in charge, he was the superior of that group of priests. He would wake up early every morning and iron their clothes and fix some breakfast. Because he understood that a leader who's a Christian doesn't come to get served. They come to serve. 
And then they said at night, they would gather around and listen to his teachings. And they said he would take them to such a spiritual level, like that would blow their minds. The teachings of uh, St. Ignatius Loyola, uh, spiritual teachings, which are really deep. If you haven't checked them out, check them out. And this is what Paul is telling us. Husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church. And you say, oh, you don't know my wife. She's so hard to love. You know, she's mean to me. Well, has she stuck a nail in your hands? Has she stuck a nail in your foot? Has she put a crown of thorns on your head? Because this is what we did to Jesus and he still loved us. And we're being called to love our wives like Jesus loved us. I told you, you're not going to be able to do this academically, legalistically, scholarly. Only supernaturally can this be done. Only supernaturally. And I believe, like I said, I've not obtained this, but I believe it's obtainable. And when we obtain it, we'll have that powerful marriage that St. Peter and Penelope had, where they could go to their crucifixions together and encourage one another in their deaths. I believe this is what the church is calling us to be like. But I know there's many people out there that just feel so lost, you know. I had someone comment, well, you know, forget about me. I've been married and divorced five times and the person I'm with now, I'm not even married to. It's funny you should say that. <laughs> it's funny you should say that because Jesus met a woman at the well and asked her where her husband was. And she said, I'm not married. And he said, oh, you tell me the truth. You're not married. But you've been married five times. And the man you're with now isn't even your husband. And in ancient times, for a holy man to talk to a woman would be scandalous. For a holy Jewish man to talk to a Samaritan woman would be scandalous. For a holy man to talk to a sinful woman, because that was considered, you know, divorce is considered a major sin. This woman was divorced five times and she's with a man, sleeping with a man she's not even married to. Whoa. Why would Jesus talk to that woman? Because the kindness of God leads us to repentance. And the world looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. And she was at that well alone in midday when the sun was burning because all the other women went in the morning. And she was an outcast. She was an outcast. Jesus calls outcast. But now you're going to learn the rest of the story. <laughs> When Jesus told that woman he was the Messiah, she was the first woman outside of his group of apostles. The first person he revealed who he really was, was to this sinful woman who ran and became the first missionary. <laughs> she became the first evangelist and went to the town and told all the people and they all believed. But that's not the rest of the story. That's not the rest of the story. She went all over the place telling people about Jesus. She was considered equal to the apostles, was her nickname, because she won so many people to Christ. Nero hated her so much, he would beat her and torture her, threw her into a dungeon, and she still would not deny Christ. So finally, Nero tried another, another tactic. He sent her into a room full of gold and diamonds and he had his servants come and put perfume on her and fan her and just treat her like a queen. And then he sent his daughter in to talk to her and said, my father will give you all this. You'll be, you'll be treated as a queen. All you have to do is publicly deny Jesus. When the woman at the well came out, Nero's daughter was converted. <laughs> she was a Christian and Nero got so mad. He beat her and beat her and threw her into a deep well to die, thinking that that was punishment. But there's no place she would rather die than the place she met the Lord, who through his kindness changed her heart. And before she went on her great missionary trip, the apostles baptized her, and her baptism name was Fotini. It means enlightened one. And today, Catholics honor and venerate St. Fotini. So no matter how lost you are, no matter how messed up your life is, you can become a saint. 
Start by going to confession and then ask the Lord to show you where to go from there. God bless and stay Catholic.